Hi guys, it is October 31st, 2019 today, and I am back on. It is time to start teaching on uh, the commandments of God um, from, Jan from July until uh, pretty much the end of September, early October. I was teaching some of the foundational stuff of why we need to know about the commandments of God. And uh, I must admit, with trepidation, I have been avoiding coming on here, but um, I can't run any longer. So um, today I'm supposed to be uh, telling you guys, who am I? Um, why am I even doing this? Uh, so I will try to tell you a little bit about that. Uh, so, who am I? My name is Julia Kelly. Uh, I am not a professional. I am not a um, ministry. Um, I am not sanctioned by anyone other than God. Uh, I've never been to Bible college. I am a homeschooling mom. And a lot of what I learned about the Bible has been from sitting down with my children, teaching them how to read through the Bible, and then when children ask questions, you answer them. And when they ask tough questions, you start digging. And then from there, as I taught my children how to read the Bible, I started reading the Bible. I started uh, chasing after God. Help me to understand this. I'm a mom. My children have questions. My pastor can't help me. The people I go to that have been to Bible college can't help me. Um, none of their answers were sitting right with my spirit. They weren't uh, understandable for my children. And um, so as I started chasing after God, he just started opening up uh, the scriptures. And the end of Luke, I don't have my Bible in front of me, but it says that Jesus um, gave the disciples the ability to understand the scriptures. And this is where I read that verse. And I'm like, God, I want that. I want the revelation. I want you to open up my eyes. I want to understand. I want to have the wisdom to be able to teach my children. And that's where he started teaching me the fear of the Lord. When we were reading from Genesis to Deuteronomy, um, we ended up having to go through it four times. And as I got to the end of Deuteronomy, the Lord said, no, go back. And I'd get to Deuteronomy again, go back. And so he had us read with the children through uh, what I would call the Torah, um, the first five books of the Bible. Um, evangelical um, denominations call it the Pentateuch. Had to do it uh, multiple times. And then about two years ago, uh, the Lord, uh, so this, this is 2019. So four years ago, the Lord had me um, or gave me a download I was fasting during Hanukkah. It was the year that Hanukkah was um, from, it was during the Christmas holidays. And I just felt the Lord say like, this is the festival of lights. If you want to receive light, fast and um, come to me. And so while everyone else was celebrating Christmas and all that, I was tucked away in my room. <laughs> I was chasing after the giver of the gifts. And he gave me this massive download for the Fear of the Lord and Prosper. Uh, it's in its final uh, draft stage right now. Um, we have to figure out how to get it up on my website so that people can download it for free. And uh, basically, he just started walking us through what is the Fear of the Lord and unpacking what is the Fear of the Lord according to the biblical definition, not according to the theological uh, reasonings that have been taught in Bible college because the traditions of men have really twisted what the true fear of the Lord is and it simply put is obey his commandments and as you obey his commandments you're going to develop such an awesome respect and love for our heavenly father Jesus came to bring us to the father we don't stop at Jesus and so um if we preach just the gospel of the cross, we're going to get to Jesus and stop. But if we are preaching the gospel of the kingdom, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 19, it talks about how um, those who do and teach the commandments of God will be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And when I read that verse to my children, I'm like, God, I want that. 
because I don't want to be the least. I don't want to be a street sweeper in heaven. I want to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And um, so going back to who am I? Um, I mentioned before, I'm a homeschool mom. Um, I have four little children from two up to 11. Uh, I am married. I've been happily married for 16 years, although I guess I should back that up. I have been married for 16 years. Not all of them have been happily. Um, I had a very much of a Jezebel Levite and Ahab marriage at the beginning. And um, it was very a difficult marriage at the beginning. Uh, we came close to divorce twice. And through amazing women just coming through my life and giving me resources, they started highlighting to me that, wait a minute, um, I'm out of order here. I'm supposed to be submissive to my husband. I'm supposed to be submitted to his authority. And my fear and my control and my lack of trust and all of these different things, this feminist thing of I'm equal with my husband and don't ever be under a man and all these things that have been taught with the feminist movement, they were trashing my marriage. And thankfully, these women came through my life. They ended up giving me resources to help wake me up. I had one pastor that uh, quite bluntly told me I had a Jezebel spirit. And um, I'm like, yes, finally, I know what's wrong with me. Went through deliverance. Uh, that was quite a turnaround. Um, since then, we've gone through deliverance four times. And um, just going through layer by layer of cleanup. And I'll be the first one to tell you I'm not perfect. Far from it, God still got a lot of cleaning up to do with me. But when it comes to the law through the eyes of Jesus, um, this course is part two of the fear of the Lord and prosper, basically. Um, because with the fear of the Lord, it tells you to obey God's commandments. But if you don't know what God's commandments are, it's a little hard to obey them. And so... He gave me this download two years ago. I was standing in line uh, at a go-kart place and um, it was in Niagara Falls. We were there for a family function and as we were waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting, the Lord just started uh, downloading this and he said, put this away for um, a later time, um, but when the time is right, I'm going to... Uh, let you teach this stuff. And I'm like, God, I can't do this. I don't know this stuff. I'm not a rabbi. I, all the, I'm not, I'm not. And are we going to obey God when we feel, when we hear those accusing lies? Or are we going to cave in and say, I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. And so with trepidation and with faith the size of a mustard seed, I'm stepping out. I'm going to start teaching uh, the commandments of God. And the way that I'm going to end up unfolding this stuff, uh, there is a PDF that I was using with my children when we first went through this. So after I got the, uh, the download at uh, the go-kart place, um, I started looking into it. I'm like, God, if I'm going to be teaching things, I need to know what they are. And so I found a PDF on the 613 commandments of God. Now, those are not the only ones, but it is a really good foundation of where to start. It's organized, um, and especially with that specific PDF, it is um, categorized by topics. So that's what I'm going to go through. And then I'm going to tie them, the commandments of the law of Moses, into what the rest of the Bible says. Because so many times throughout my um, throughout my life, uh, I was born into a Christian home. I was born into the home mission field of Canada. So I'm a Canadian. Uh, if you haven't figured that out yet, um, I was born into a family of a preacher who had gone to Bible college. They went into the home mission field. And then at four years old, we went to the overseas mission field. I, um, was sent to boarding school when I was seven years old, Christian boarding school. And um, then I ended up coming back to Canada full time when I was 17 years old, ended up going into nursing school, into the Canadian military. And um, 
then due to a accident um, and ended up getting medically discharged from the military um, and then eventually with everything that went on we ended up moving from one part of Canada to another part of Canada with my husband's work and then just about two years ago, right when all of this download started, the Lord told me walk away from my job. And that was a challenge because if I am a nurse and I'm making a nurse's wages and I stop working, how are we going to survive financially? And so that was a challenge and God warned me that not only did he want me to walk away from my job, he also wanted to burn my bridge that where he was going to lead me was going to be so difficult, <laughs> which I agree, um, that I would want to go running back to my civilian job. And he said, you need to burn your bridge, die to yourself, come and follow me. I've got bigger plans, better plans for you, um, but it is going to require you to lay down everything. And it has been everything. Um, and so I ended up surrendering my nursing license a couple years ago and, uh, being fully full-time stay at home, God asked us to do some really crazy things. And again, just learning to walk that walk of radical obedience, not only to obeying his commandments in a culture that, um, not only a world culture, but also church culture that says you're being legalistic if you obey God's commandments. No, that's called obedience. Legalism is obeying the traditions of men, actually. Uh, legalism is doing things in order to earn salvation based on your own efforts, your own works. Obedience to God's commandments should be birthed out of love. He has already loved us in order to save us. So therefore, we respond to that by desiring to live a righteous life, desiring to live a holy life, to not have anything come in between us to ruin that intimacy. So, um, let's see, where was I going with this? He told me not to come with a script, so... I am being humble and I completely lost my place here. Um, Holy Spirit, where do you want to take this? So going back to this, who am I? Okay, let me just learn. So who am I? Back in my journaling, back in 2015, the Lord told me that I am a healing evangelist with a prophetic anointing. I argued with him for three years <laughs> until I finally admitted, okay, God, I get it. I understand my original definition of evangelist was completely wrong. Um, I had always seen the people that stand on the church corner or um, out in the middle of the street holding up placards and yelling and screaming and I ended up realizing a lot of those people are carrying a religious spirit and their behavior is actually causing more people to um, run away from God not running to God and so um, what he showed me was that I was what uh, back then he told me I was a hybrid um, evangelist and prophet anointing like John the Baptist and that although John the Baptist was called a prophet his message was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and um, with having both of those that the evangelist of preaching the word of God of um, calling people to repentance calling people back into the plumb line of the scriptures that um, that is what I was called to do. Um, and I've also learned over the last four years that my pr primary um, audience, if you will, is actually the church, not 
um, those who have not been evangelized. So I will use a lot of scripture. I'm going to use a lot of religious lingo that is more common to the church. If you are someone who has never received Christ, um, it's not as scary as you think. It is the most awesome relationship, and I'm sorry that the church has butchered it to make it into such a churchianity. And I'm so sorry for all of the people, myself included, over so many decades um, that have made it about church traditions instead about Jesus the person and about the Heavenly Father who wants a personal relationship with you, who wants to have that personal conversation, not just him barking at us, but him having fellowship, intimacy with us. He knows everything we've done wrong and he still loves us. And he's not there with a big stick to beat us on the head. If anyone is going to end up getting the big stick on their backs, it's those who have preached a gospel of tolerance, who have preached from the pulpits that have um, taught that their ways, their pride, their ministry, their denomination is more important than the Heavenly Father and having a relationship with Him. And so the gospel of the kingdom is for the humble. It's for those who are willing to lay down their wants, their flesh, and willing to say, you know what, I don't have it all together, but I am willing to throw everything upon Jesus and trust that when he says, do this, and I meet my conditions, that God will meet his conditions and that the blessings will flow. And so the whole purpose, I guess, of the law through the eyes of Jesus is to start bringing people back into those blessings, to bring them back into the healing. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, uh, verses 12, and then also 15, it talks about that God will take away all sickness if we repent. And we've gotten to see so much of that in our own family where um, we have had bowel issues and female disorders and infertility and uh, sleep apnea and um, migraine headaches and oodles more I'm not going to get into here. We've seen those healed in our family as we have turned away from the traditions of man and started walking into obedience with God. And so um, I've got a question here that I'm going to answer. Um, So there's a woman here saying uh, that she was submissive once and it turned out very bad. Um, that there's nothing wrong with a woman being equal to a man. And what do you do when you have trust issues with God? Um, so there is a difference between being controlled and being under domination and being submissive. True submission is voluntary. It is not forced. And it is submission in the um, position of honor. It is in a submission in the position of love. Um, as soon as someone is trying to dominate you through control, through fear, through intimidation, through anger, um, that is very often a Jezebel spirit in operation, and that is not true, healthy marriage uh, submission. A woman is to submit to her husband um, in the sense that allowing him to take the lead, allowing him to be in charge. And the thing is, that allows him to be a man. I got to see this within my own marriage, where um, for the first majority of our marriage, I was in charge. I was ex-military officer and I was officer at work and I came home and I was officer in the home and I barked orders at my husband and told him what to do, how to do it, where to do it. He had no opportunity to make a decision in our marriage because I was so controlling and it squeezed the life right out of him. 
Um, he was just a shell of a man. And um, as the Lord started rebuking me quite hardly um, and started waking me up that what I was doing was wrong and started bringing some different people into my life to show me that the thing that I was actually aiming for in the process of control was I wanted to feel safe. And um, because there was abuse in my background, that I felt that if I controlled everything and everyone around me, that I would be able to keep myself safe. But that actually put me in the place of a victim because if I have to control everything, I'm actually being victimized by my own control. And so that ended up causing more harm and more um, damage uh, and victimizing me in the process. As the Lord taught me to surrender control and allow my husband to protect me and allow him. And you know what? He blew it sometimes. At the beginning, I used to say that I felt like the scum on the bottom of his shoe as he had to learn to trust me. And the thing is, if we struggle with trust with man, with our own fathers, with our own family, with our own husbands, uh, with our own coworkers or whatnot, um, a lot of times we transfer that lack of trust with our human relationships to a lack of trust with God. And honestly, over the last two years, God has really been uh, teaching me how to trust him, going through a lot of very difficult uh, training grounds. Um, he warned me I was gonna go into a two year season of boot camp. And then um, just a few months ago, he told me that it's time to go to the special forces training. And I'm like, no, he warned me about GI Jane and what she had to go through. And I'm like, God, I don't wanna go through that. And yet at the same time, it's like, but I want what's at the end of it. And I know that if I truly surrender and I am humble enough to learn the lessons he wants to take me through, to jump off the cliff and get to experience him catching me, um, it has been very difficult two years. And I know it's not done yet, but I have gotten to see my trust in God grow. And so to answer that question, what happens when you have trust issues with God? You give him the opportunity to grow that trust and to be willing to be vulnerable because that's one of the big things with trust. Um, the Lord showed me in my journaling that there are four keys with trust and intimacy that first level is access. Are we even going to give God access into our hearts? Two is transparency. Are we willing to be vulnerable and bare before the Lord when we're hurting, when we've screwed up, when we have sin issues? Are we willing to be transparent and let God into those painful areas? Especially for someone who has been abused, those painful areas go very deep. And it has been a process of allowing God to lance those wounds, allow the pus to drain, allow healing to come into those very painful areas and um, allow his word to wash those areas clean. To um, And it's a messy process. Anyone who has uh, stayed by me during the last two years, to be honest, we lost the majority of our friends because... It's a messy process of becoming vulnerable, of getting to that place where you can um, become real instead of wearing the masks all the time that you are allowed to be you and still be loved and learning what unconditional love is. When you've grown up in an environment where you were a tool for somebody else to step on for someone else to use you in order for them to build their own kingdom, which by the way, is the spirit of Pharaoh. You can read about it in Isaiah 30, um, where you have been victimized to get to that place, to be vulnerable enough before God and even before some of the closest people. And sometimes being vulnerable, a lot of people don't want to know. They don't want to see who the real you is. But I can tell you one thing. God already knows who the real you is. They, he already knows. And he loves you so much that he wants 
you to know who the real you is and to get to that place of healing and to be comfortable in your own skin, to be able to be comfortable enough to get on a video and talk about all this stuff and to get to the place that you know you are worthy in his eyes. Um, that you are lovable in his eyes. When the world has told you, you've screwed up too many times, you've done the wrong things, you've sinned too many times, you're covered in tattoos, you're covered in piercings, you're, you're covered in too much leprosy. And so we decide, you know what, I'm either gonna wear it in pride on one hand, or I'm going to hide in shame on the other hand. And then God says, no, give me your leprosy. I'm willing to touch you when no one else is willing to touch you. And so this journey that God has been bringing me through is what he wants to bring all of you through that are willing to actually listen through all of this, through the law, through the eyes of Jesus. It's about confronting the leprosy that is in our souls, that is in our spirits, and for some of us, even on our flesh. Because if we tolerate leprosy to stay in our skin, or sorry, in our spirit, it will start to manifest outward in our flesh. And if you read through Deuteronomy 28 of the different curses, um, read through the blessings too, because you want to know where you're going. But if you see any of the curses manifesting in your life right now, rejoice. I know that sounds really backwards, but rejoice because if you are willing to admit that there are curses active in your life, you are at the beginning stage of being willing to repent and willing to actually work on your sin and recognize there is hope because look at all those blessings that are waiting for me. And we have gotten to see the transference from the cursing side and how God has transferred us slowly towards the blessing side. We're not perfect. We're not all the way there yet. But we have uh, gotten to see our marriage is the best it has ever been. Our children, they are um, a work in progress, <laughs> as we all are. But I enjoy my children now, which is not something I could have said many years ago. That I absolutely hated being a mom before. And now I enjoy being a mom. Because as I worked on my own sin and one, the generational iniquity flowing from me down stopped going down to my children, a lot of their behavioral shows stopped. And then two, as they saw me humbly trying to walk out of my sin and they saw me fall flat on my face, sometimes run away and hide in a hole for a little bit, but then finally get to the point where I wanted to be back in the arms of Jesus, wanting to be back in the arms of my Heavenly Father, wanting to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit again, of getting to that place of humbling my pride. And it's a daily dying to your pride um, and getting back into that embrace and how they've gotten to see that struggle and how they have gotten to the place of humbling themselves and how because they, my children have watched me do this back and forth and recognizing you know, I'm not perfect, they have learned um, to start breaking the cycle of perfectionism, which is so common within church circles, that that spirit of religion gets in and then the pressure and the performance and the perfectionist comes in. And if you are not absolutely perfect, God is gonna hit you with a big stick and you're gonna get kicked out of church. And you're going to lose your social circle and all of these threats that come. Those threats are not from God. They may be from your pastor. They may be from church culture. Um, they may be from parents that just, they grew up with a religious uh, spirit themselves. But God is not going to kick you out just because you have sin. There is an issue that he will not hear you if there is iniquity and now what is iniquity iniquity is unrepented of sin and so if you notice that it feels like you can't hear god's voice if you feel like there's like you're hitting that brass ceiling 
then chances are there's iniquity present. Uh, Isaiah 59 talks about that. But the key there is repent. And the thing is, this is where as we walk through the law through the eyes of Jesus, as they start walking through the different commandments and helping you identify what is iniquity. Um, Nehemiah chapter 9, the first three verses, when the people came out of Babylon, they had been exiled to Babylon for 70 years. People had grown up in bondage. They did not know God's commandments, but there were some of them that wanted more. They wanted more than living as a slave in Babylon had to offer. And they were willing to make the journey back to Jerusalem. They were willing to go with Ezra without any human protection and to completely throw themselves onto the protection of the Lord, onto the mercy of the Lord, onto his covenant that he would protect them as they were carrying all of this precious plunder out of Babylon and back to Jerusalem, that they got to Jerusalem and Ezra wept because they did not know the laws of God. They were there to build, rebuild the temple. They were passionate, they were zealous, they were willing to walk away from everything in order to start over again. And they didn't know. And this was one of the things that God has really been uh, sort of pumping into my heart um, over the last little while of how can they follow me if they don't know me? How can they follow me if they don't know my commandments? How can they repent if they don't even know what sin is? And so this is what this course is going to be about. What is sin? Because once you know what it is, then you can go through that process of repentance because Jesus came, his primary mandate. Um, it says, and Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He did not say, go ask for forgiveness at the cross. He said, repent, which means change your thinking, change your actions, change and move a different direction. So forgiveness is part of that. Um, that is getting the sin cleansed away. But we have to walk into God's commandments. We have to walk into obedience. And so as we do that, we will actually get to manifest the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus told us to his disciples, as you go preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. And so the primary part of my teaching with the law through the eyes of Jesus, the primary part is going to be cleansing the lepers because leprosy is uh, basically an outward manifestation in the Bible of an inward sin, an inward attitude uh, or thought that was sinful and it ended up manifesting. So for example, Miriam, she ended up uh, talking against Moses and she ended up getting leprosy. Uh, Gehazi ended up going behind Elisha's back and uh, because of his greed, and greed is a heart attitude before it manifests out in the flesh, and he ended up getting leprosy. And um, Naaman was another man who did have leprosy, and he came to Elisha, and he was told, go dip in the Jordan River seven times. So the Jordan River, the water, washing with the water of the word. So as we uh, wash in the water of the word together, I'm going to be teaching a lot of uh, scriptures. I will have more notes with the next one, so I will ramble on and go in circles so much. Um, but uh, as we go through this, you're going to see more healing, more fruit, more understanding your identity because the other thing too is a son of God a child of God has been tutored by the law excuse me and a bastard is one who is not um, submitting to the discipline of the father and so discipline is instruction as well as correction and so part of 
being discipled by the word, being discipled by the Holy Spirit himself who teaches you all things and he will bring remembrance of all things uh, to you that as he instructs through the word, through different people, through books, um, that he will tell you what you are to do and then he will convict you either through the word, through inner voice, through um, other people. Um, you're going to start seeing over the next little while a lot of people coming out with warnings and especially about pride. That's I even had to deliver a warning yesterday about pride. And uh, I ended up getting a dream. A little bit of that dream was um, just part of it was that the person came to me in the dream and they had a wound on their arm and they're like, you got to pray for me right now, right now. I want this healed right now. And it was so shrouded in shadows that I was struggling to see it. And so I had to pull up the torch on my phone. Um, why it's called a torch and a flashlight. I'm not exactly sure, but in the Bible, um, a torch is also the lamp of the Lord, which is the law of God. And when I inspected that wound, I could see it wasn't a real wound. It was actually a fake, like those uh, movie plaster wounds, like those stage makeup. And it was starting to peel off a little bit. And in the dream, I'm like, okay, well, I'll pray for you. And I prayed for the person and they're like, yay, yay, hallelujah, I'm healed, I'm healed. And then they go and lay on my bed, eating sour cream, spreading sour cream all over the bed. And um, gotta love the symbology of dreams. And I go out and I see all of this and I'm like, uh, no, I do not uh, like this. This person is impinging on my stuff and my food and my place of intimacy. And yet my little kids are trying to peek through the door and nap time's not over yet. Um, and yet in my heart, I'm like, we're supposed to, we're supposed to give unconditional love. So I just have to suck it up and stop being so selfish. And so I was rebuking myself in the dream that I struggled with this person showing disrespect and dishonor and a complete lack of manners, um, for doing what he was doing. And, um, basically not respecting boundaries and then my husband in the dream comes in and he says look at the leprous warts was the word he used now i know from um with be in health ministries uh they teach about the spiritual roots of disease and uh warts especially planter warts are a spirit of rebellion so if you have plantar warts manifesting, you know that there's a spirit of rebellion in your life somewhere that needs to be identified, repented of, um, and stop doing the sin that is opening the door for that. Cast that spirit out and slam the door shut by changing your attitudes and behaviors. And um, leprosy is basically the evidence of something that is unclean. And that man wanted healing of the visible wound what he drew attention to but he did not want healing of the leprosy he did not want healing of the unclean he did not want healing of the rebellion and um he still wanted to have access to intimacy access to um provision without the repentance and in the dream, it was my husband, which represents Jesus. So Jesus is the bridegroom. We are the bride. Um, ends up removing this person out of our house. And so when I ended up delivering that warning to a specific person, but then as I was pondering it earlier today with my quiet time with the Lord, and uh, the Lord told me, share this dream because this is a warning to my church that we are going to see a lot of people removed by Jesus himself 
because they refused to deal with their uncleanness and they refused to deal with their rebellion. And they are no longer going to be tolerated um, as part of the congregation, as part of his place where the provision and the presence flows. And a lot of it really boils down to pride. If their pride came before rebellion, it was um, Satan's pride that caused him to rebel against God, caused him to lead a rebellion against God. And as a result, he ended up getting kicked out of the presence of God. And so um, when we can recognize where are the areas of pride in my life, where have I been saying my way is better, that my denomination is better, my pastor's teaching is better, my interpretation is better than what God says in his word. That is where pride opens the door to so many things. And if you read, I think it's Job 41, I think, about Leviathan. Um, and by the way, rejection is part of pride, which is what God has been dealing with me. Because part of the whole victim thing is you build barriers when people reject you. And then you start building barriers. And whenever you build a barrier around your heart, that um, the Holy Spirit um, can't get between those scales where no air can get through. And so um, I'm being honest about my junk in my trunk um, to let you know that I don't have it all perfectly together. And yet God has given me this download of the law through the eyes of Jesus um, and that we will walk it through together. I'm not a rabbi. Um, I am not a follower of Judaism. Um, I will teach you what God has taught me. It's not going to be complete in the sense of it's not going to be a perfect, uh, complete compendium of anything. Although God has shown me that there will be a book about yay thick, about a good inch, um, by the time all of this is done. Um, but, uh, we're going to walk this journey together. So I've rambled in circles a lot. Um, so I'm going to end off now. By the way, uh, for those of you who want to catch these videos in a more organized fashion, I'm doing this live right now on Facebook, but I will be posting them up onto my YouTube channel. God has finally said it's time to start a YouTube channel. So we're going to slowly figure out how to do that. I have 14 videos loaded up already, or more importantly, my husband has put them up online, um, which I'm very grateful for because computers and me are, um, they're not my strength. So I am very thankful for my husband who computers are his strength. So we're going to be walking this journey of learning how to do YouTube land and uh, how to um, try to get things up. My YouTube channel is called My Father's Witness, just like the Facebook channel. Uh, is my father's witness. My uh, website address is www.myfatherswitness.com. And um, my son here is asking if he can go outside. And the answer is no, because it's pouring rain. But yes, you may be in the garage. So, and guys who are out there, I'm going to be real. I am not an actor. I am not professionally polished or anything. I'm going to be real. I'm going to be raw. Possibly sometimes it's going to be painful to listen to. Um, but I think we've had enough of the masks within churchianity. And I think that's part of why God is allowing me to do this now when I'm completely unpolished and that I would like to just butcher this and throw it all away right now because I'm going in circles and yet God wants us to be real and are we willing to humble ourselves are we willing to make a fool of ourselves in order to be obedient and know that it's not going to be perfect and the picture the Lord is giving me right now is a child, a toddler, 
who is doing a finger painting and God has laid out, God the Father has laid out the um, sheet of paper and all the finger paints and he's like, paint with me. And the toddler is painting and everything and paint splattering all over the child. It's all over the floor. And as a mom, that's just making me cringe right now, knowing how much that's going to take to clean up. And yet the Heavenly Father is holding up the masterpiece and saying, well done, my child, well done. And so I know that my Abba Father right now is happy. And I want you to know that he is happy with you, that he is happy when we say yes to jump with him. That when we say yes to wade into the unknown, to learn new ways of doing things with him, simply because he said, let's do it together. So God bless you. I'm gonna end off now.